Welcome. Today we are featuring the Mass Spectrometry Facility with our guest speaker, Dr. Kevin Dagbe, Senior Scientist at Scholar Rock. Kevin is also a UMass alum, receiving his PhD in 2017 from the Hardy Lab in the Chemistry Department. The title of his talk is Integrative Structural Biology, Approach to Discover the Mechanisms of Action of Antibody-Based Therapeutics Targeting the TGF-Beta Superfamily of Growth Factors. I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. We hope that with these bi-weekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass core facilities offer to our campus community, the New England region, and beyond. Just a few housekeeping items. The seminar is being recorded, as you just heard, and all replays of the seminars in this series can be found on our website, and I will put a link in the chat. We will save the Q&A till the end of the presentation. During that time, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Next, I would like to introduce you to the director of our core facilities, Andrew Bernard. Andrew? Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the fourth seminar of the Fall 21 core seminar series. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard. I'm the director of our centralized core facilities here at UMass Amherst. If you've joined us before, you've heard me discuss our state-of-the-art labs, instrumentation, equipment, and world-class experts who are helping researchers at UMass and beyond to drive discovery and pursue scientific endeavors across all disciplines. The core facilities are open to anyone from students through senior scientists, regardless of your affiliation, including researchers from other academic institutions and commercial operations. In order to maintain operations at affordable rates, the core facilities receive a significant investment from the university. In addition to this funding, the existence of core facilities depends in part on proper acknowledgement and publications. This is an important metric of value for most core facilities that enables them to obtain support so they may continue to provide their essential services in the most comprehensive ways possible. It also helps core personnel, many who do not conduct independent research to advance in their careers, adding to the overall health and standing of the core facility. You can learn more about suggested authorship and acknowledgement guidelines on our websites or via, via the Association of Biomolecular Resource Facilities, the world's largest core facilities ad advocacy group. I'll put the link in the chat after I wrap up my chat. Uh, to help access our cores, there are several funding opportunities. For those IELTS investigators on the call, uh, there are core credits, which you've heard a lot about lately, uh, and center seed funding is available. For our external users, the Mass Innovation Voucher Program subsidizes usage for small companies based in Massachusetts at up to 75%. The program has awarded more than 600 vouchers, representing more than $5 million in total project costs across the five UMass campuses over the last several years. We're here to be your partner uh, to expand your research and capabilities and help you find productivity. Feel free to reach out to me or any of the core facility directors if you have questions or would like more information on how you can engage with us. It's now my uh, pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Stephen Isles, Director of Mass Spectrometry, who will tell you a bit more about the core and then introduce our guest speaker. Take it away, Steve. Great, thanks. Um, hi to everyone. Thanks for everyone for attending. Um, I wanna give as much time as possible to Kevin, so I'm gonna zip quickly through these um, slides just to give you an idea of what mass spectrometry can do for you um, <clears throat> we can study um, anything from small molecules all the way through to um, large macromolecular complexes. And we have equipment capabilities to study uh, metabolomics, to do protein dynamics, proteomics, um, as well as elemental analysis and some imaging. Um, I don't want to give any particular examples of projects, but just some of the instrumentation we have. Um, ICPMS, which is used for uh, low level quantification of metals. Uh, we have various gas chromatography systems for looking at volatile small molecules. Um, our workhorse proteomics instrument is this Orbitrap Fusion, which has um, liquid chromatography capabilities, both at the nanoflow range all the way up to high flow. Um, we use it primarily for proteomics, but we can also do metabolomic work. And we've been recently looking at um, antibody drug conjugates, so MABs and ADCs. Um, the instrument of particular interest to this seminar is this Waters uh, Synap G2SI, which has a full suite of robotics capabilities for doing hydrogen deuterium exchange studies. Um, so you basically set it and forget it, um, as I'm sure Kevin will explain, um, which can be very powerful both in the uh, biopharma arena and at looking at protein dynamics. Then we also have, amongst other equipment, we have a, a multi toff toff system, which is our, our largest piece of equipment, kind of looks like a coffin, um, but we use it for um, 
mainly for, for imaging of uh, tissue. So we can look at lipids and small molecules as well as proteins. <clears throat> so we can, we can help you all the way through from project design to grant writing support. Uh, we train users. Um, we don't really have an awful lot of service analysis. We prefer, much prefer students to learn how to use the equipment so that when they graduate, they can go out into the world um, with these capabilities, which makes them much more attractive for um, employment. Um, and we also have some very active uh, collaborations with industry, as you're gonna hear about today. So these, this is the contact information. Um, I'm very easy to get by email. So just hit me up with an email with, with questions about a potential project and um, we'll take it from there. So without further ado, and just as my system crashes, um, I'd like to introduce, oh, it's gone. Uh, Dr. Kevin Dagby, who um, was a graduate student at UMass in the chemistry department with Professor Jeannie Hardy, and then uh, went on to become a senior scientist at Scholar Rock. Um, this is just a little bit about what he's capable of and has done. And I will not say anything more other than to say, Kevin, the floor is yours. And thanks for coming. Thanks, Steve. Thanks to the organizers, um, to Lisa. And I would like to share my slide now. Share. Can you uh, see my slides? Fine. Looks great. Okay, good. So today um, I would like to tell the story about how we actually utilize a very um, integrative approach of uh, structural biology to discover several mechanisms of actions of our antibody-based therapeutics here in Scholar Rock. And um, we will highlight some of the cases that uh, have been really successful. In fact, um, it produces some publications out of these um, um, studies. So I'll get into it now. So what's the biological target that we're actually um, after at Scholar Rock? So Scholar Rock is really very um, um, interested in the biological target of um, TJ beta super family of growth factors. There are 30 plus members of um, within this family. And it's, it has diverse biological functions. Um, and part of the teacher beta family um, members we have, if you're familiar with the transforming growth uh, beta factors, uh, uh, teacher betas, BMPs, and growth differentiating factors, uh, GDFs. These are all members that has really uh, specific uh, functions in the cell and disease um, in particular like TJ beta implicated in fibrosis, autoimmunity, cancer immune therapy, BMPs in tissue repair, brown, uh, brown fat metabolism, osteogenesis, and as well as some neuromuscular disorders, including the uh, spinal muscular atrophy that are actually a uh, company has a phase one, uh, phase incoming phase three clinical trials now. And really TJ beta is not a young target protein. It has been around for almost like 40, 40 plus years. And the discovery started way early in the 70s. And what is, how is TJ beta in general um, activated or um, really its mechanism of activation? So an example for this is a, a representative of the TJ beta super family of growth factors is TJ beta one. Um, basically TJ beta is expressed in the cell as an inactive, um, Latin uh, protein, and it has a specific structural component in there. It's like, it has a protomain and it has a growth factor. Really the protomain anchors like a, a, a cage to hold the growth factor itself. So how is it activated? Basically the known mechanisms so far in general are proteases as well as integrins triggers activations. So basically with proteases, there are uh, protease cleavage sites within the protein it cleaves it and then series of activation processes happens or proteolytic events happens. For integrin base, there's basically force dependent. In, the, in, in some of the, uh, in the case of TJ beta, 
Um, it has an RGD site, so essentially an integrin that binds to the RGD region, for, uh, pulls it apart, thus releasing the, the growth factor here. So basically, once it's released, the solar growth factor is active and binds to the corresponding receptors in the cell and thus um, performs the biological functions for that specific um, digit, beta, digit beta family member. So I think the challenge here is really targeting digit beta. Why is it so challenging? Really, it's so difficult to achieve selective inhibition. I think that's the key challenge here. Why is that so? Um, uh, essentially, the mature growth factor, if you actually remember, um, the, the, the mature growth factor is highly, has a high degree of conservation, meaning the sick, if we sequence among the TGF beta, TGF beta family members, the uh, sequence is uh, really uh, uh, highly conserved. And these, um, these receptors also uh, binds multiple ligands. So one receptor, for example, can bind multiple uh, growth factors within the TGF beta family. So there's really very challenging um, 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 key uh, challenging aspect of uh, selectively inhibiting one specific uh, TG beta member. So we're not the only company that tried this approach, uh, this uh, targeting the TG beta family. In fact, several companies have already tried um, approaches, including really, uh, as I mentioned, integrins can activate TG beta or, or proteases. Some actually companies tried to inhibit the um, um, activators, like binding to the integrins or proteases. Some actually binds to the growth factor, inhibits the signaling of TJ beta by binding to the growth factor. Some actually binds to the receptor. But this traditional um, inhibitors target signaling of multiple TJ beta isoforms. And what that comes surprised of um, having some issues around toxicity, which is the central therapeutic challenge for traditional approaches to TJ beta inhibition. Uh, one, in one really particular for specific for TJ beta um, is the existence of um, uh, cardiac valve toxicity. If you have a like a non-specific um, inhibition of TJ beta, and today there's no TJ beta inhibitor drugs approved, so that's really make us kind of like um, our grand challenge for the company. So what is our approach? Um, so how would we make a very selective, uh, selective inhibition of TG, one specific member of the TJ beta family out of the 30 plus members of the TJ beta super family of growth factors. So basically our approach is really targeting the TJ beta in their latent inactive forms um, to selectively um, uh, uh, modulate the growth factor activity. So what we mean by that is that we selectively target this complex instead of targeting just the growth, mature growth factor itself. Really what, the, what drives us to really handle this specific approach is that the, the data that, that actually um, convinces us to really do this approach is the uh, poorly con poor conservation of the prodomain, right? It's really up to just 49% identical across TJ beta family members. So basically um, we can, we think we can actually um, bind specific unique regions within this uh, prodomain um, as opposed to targeting the mature growth factor, which has really high conservation around 80% identical across um, the mature growth factor within the TJ beta super family. So we then, this is our, our testing this hypothesis in the company and that we, that greater selectivity may, may achieve both efficacy and safety in the clinic. So to date, um, I would just like it to give you a background of or uh, an information about the current drug discovery pipeline. Um, it's called ROG. So we're actually very multifaceted in terms of uh, uh, disease indications, ranging from spinal muscular atrophy and other myostatin-related disorders. So we have currently our lead molecule, epigromab, um, for spinal muscular atrophy, now in uh, phase, almost towards the end of phase two clinical trial. And we're now starting for um, another myostatin related disorders for this uh, specific molecule. We also have really interesting oncology and immune oncology indications targeting TJ beta one in this case. So across um, fibrosis also, 
we also have TJ Beta. In this case, we actually partnered with, partnered it with Gilead Sciences and some um, um, indications around restricted anemias. So basically these are all targeting um, TJ Beta members, TJ Beta uh, super family of growth factors. So for the case, for the first case, um, I would like to somehow give you a, tell you a story about how we discovered SRK015 really, and how we use structural approaches to discover it's a mechanism of action. Um, this has been published in JBC um, and um, I will tell you this story now. So the target protein for this specific case is a myostatin. So myostatin is also known as the growth differentiation factor eight. So it negatively regulates skeletal muscle growth. And in fact, it's overexpression results in a substantial decrease in skeletal muscle mass. And genetic deficiencies in myostatin in humans and other species are significantly increases in muscle mass with a few apparent detrimental effects. So thus, um, we think that inhibition of myostatin signaling may provide a therapeutic opportunity to impact diseases of muscle wasting. So I, I would like to remind you of the promycidin activation step. It actually involves two proteases to, to fully mature uh, uh, the, uh, the promycidin. So basically it has this protomain, um, it, within the protomain it has a toroid site and in between the protomain and the mature growth factor there is a cleavage site for figurine. Uh, and once first step of uh, con uh, convertase um, uh, action, it, it actually breaks this covalent bond, but then maintaining the non-covalent co non -covalent interaction of the protomain and the mature growth factor itself. After such cleavage of a toloid by toloid protease, there just is now such a time that the uh, mature growth factor can now be released and do its function. So, what is this antibody that we have against uh, my Latin, uh, pro Latin myostatin? Uh, we name it apitagromab. Um, it's an investigate, uh, um, uh, it's still a, a, a clinical, in clinical dev development currently. This is an anti pro myostatin monoclonal antibody, um, uh, which we aim to um, improve um, inhibiting my pro myostatin. We aim that it can improve motor function in patients with spinal muscular atrophy, which is a rare neuromuscular disease. So we have early clinical data, which really um, uh, convinces that um, it, it's a very important um, um, discovery effort. So significant increases in muscle mass and function in healthy mice, we saw that. And in preclinical mouse models of dexamethasone induced muscle atrophy. And there's some improvement if we inhibit um, promyostatin, latmyostatin using apitagromab, there is some improvement in bone phenotype in mouse. We have a publication in human molecular genetics where, um, and we are now in phase two for patients with um, type two, type three SMA. And we have also other publications um, around this uh, molecule, around assessment and toxicity, toxicokinetics of the epidogromab antibodies. And we also published our phase one safety trial, safety pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic study of this um, novel inhibitor of um, uh, pro-latent myostatin. So pro epidogromab is what, how do, how do we discover this uh, epidogromab? So basically, um, we have found a way um, to uh, express and isolate or purify uh, prolated myostatin. And that actually enables us to, um, to, to uh, proceed to antibody discovery. We use a technology platform called Phage Display. So with the uh, uh, facial display discovery, antibody discovery campaign, we discovered parental uh, 29H4, we call this antibody initially. Um, and then we have some affinity maturation um, for this parental uh, uh, antibody, 29H4, we, I, we labeled it 29H4-16. And later, um, on the other hand, we also engineered or germline um, parental 29H4, making it 29H4GL, it's like germline. 
and then putting it at a flat form of an anti full, full antibody, monoclonal antibody, uh, using a human IgG4, um, we call this now the drug, the investigational drug epitigromab. So the antibody we generated from the campaign is really um, um, of high uh, nanomolar binders, as you can see here in the in the slides. Uh, it binds both pro and late myostatin, and it's very functional. Um, it's um, it's really active against um, uh, the uh, my, my, against um, inhibiting the activity of myostatin using cell-based assay. And with 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 the uh, with the activity and the nanomolar binders, we really are interested of really understanding how this antibody binds to our protein. So, basically, what we did is that the first thing we had we did was we uh, generated a co-crystal structure of the antibody, and the antibody that we use is a 29H416, the affinity mature um, for version of the protein, because essentially this is what as you know, if you're a crystallographer, you tried several approaches and combinations and crystallization screens. So this is what we what we uh, we crystallize and get a really good 2.79 angstrom resolution of, a, of of the structure. So this is a fab uh, antibody fragments, and you can actually see that the antibody binds uh, to the um, dimer of the protein on top of the like arm region of the prodomain. Here, so so the myostatin is like this is like a cross arm here, and it's a V shape, and you can see two fabs binding on top of it, and this is another representation of seeing really looking at in, looking into the details of the promyostatin. You can see here the protomain and the growth factor are highlighted in R range, and also you can see the heavy chain and the light chain of the fab, the antibody by uh, antibody by antibody fragment um, of 29H416. So the binding interface uh, eluded so many uh, critical interactions uh, ranging from um, hydrophobic interaction, as you can see I labeled here, hydrophobic patches, um, some uh, critical hydrogen binding interaction as well as salt bridges uh, we saw in the binding interface. And basically what drives most of the surface contact is the um, the CDR heavy chain um, loop three of the antibody and some contributions from CDR loop two of the antibody. And this is really what really excites us so much because we, this, uh, as we, if, and we look at the epitope of the antibody um, in the promyostatin, we saw the exquisite um, selectivity. Uh, we can explain how, why this antibody is very uh, select or specific. Essentially, if you look at the epitope, which is I highlighted in uh, green, you can see that this epitope is really unique to um, uh, permyostatin. And if you compare it to the rest of the um, members of the uh, TG beta family, it's uh, it's really highly divergent. So that uh, that actually makes us very um, um, kind of like um, confident that explains why such exquisite selectivity of um, SRK015 or epitogromab uh, towards the promyotis that it doesn't bind to other members of the TJ beta family. So the crystal structure is really uh, very important data for us, but uh, it actually it, it is not a complete story, right? So um, the epitope revealed by x crystal structure reveals a snapshot into the MOA. There are some other points that really um, give us kind of like scratching our head really. And we know that it binds to the arm region um, of the protein, but then essentially the protease cleavage sites, it's kind of distant uh, from, from the binding region or the epitope. So uh, this was unexpected because uh, we have, I haven't, I didn't uh, show the data, but the, the antibody actually inhibits toloid protease mediated activation of myostatin precursor. So then if you look at the crystal structure, I didn't really uh, show it so much, but uh, the structure really missing a lot of lectin density around the loop adjoining the cleavage sites is really highly disordered and including the furin and the toloid site of permyostatin. Uh, thus uh, we think that the mechanism of inhibition cannot be distinguished by the crystal structure alone. So, because 
the question of the steric blockade of the protease preventing access to the proteolytic cleavage site, we can't really um, explain it. Or antibody binding eliciting conformational changes in the loop adjoining the proteolytic cleavage sites, making this um, loop less accessible to proteolytic processing. So it really drives us to uh, explore further avenue, further structural approaches to really, uh, to really um, uh, dissect the um, molecular mechanism or binding mechanism of this antibody. So then we resorted to HDX. So uh, thanks to Steve for the help and for the great uh, um, instrumentation um, at UMass. Um, in fact, I've been using um, the UMass facility for so long now for almost like in my entire stay in Scholarac, I'm almost, I, I, I've been uh, in Scholarac for four years already. So, and I'm constantly using um, uh, the instrument um, there in, in, in UMass IELTS with the help of Steve IELTS. So what we did for this is just to, with the HDX, we use it to study the conformational changes in pro-latent mycid and up and binding of the antibody. So what we use as a sample we use a promyostatin as well as the latent myostatin, and we um, combine it with uh, with or without the FAB. This is a FAB, um, SRK015 or the apitigromab or the high affinity matured version of 29 of, of our um, 29H4 parental antibody. So really the rationale why I use pro and latent myostatin uh, because of the existence of this um, Forms um, in different parts of, of um, in, the, in, the, in different parts of the um, anatomy. Essentially, um, pro promyostatin, which is which is the uncleaved form of promyostatin, uh, is found mostly in skeletal skeletal muscle, and and some of the latent myostatin, which are pure and cleave, predominates in the serum. So basically. Um, um, in the context in the context of accessibility to extracellular modulators like neutralizing antibodies, both the pro and the latent precursor forms are relevant. So this is the uh, data for the um, sequence coverage, a linear peptide sequence coverage for both the pro myostatin and the latent myostatin. Um, the myostatin basically this it ranges from 88 to 94 percent. So uh, but this actually not comes with an easy uh, uh, experiment, right? So this looks really like, oh, re really good data. But essentially, prior to getting this really good data, uh, I want to highlight that there are some um, kind of like hiccups along the way, right? It's like overpressure. There's no, like, when you look at the uh, initial analysis by PLGS, you'll see, oh, there is a, there's a bad coverage. Uh, PLGS score is really low. So we actually had some kind of um, um, uh, um, troubleshooting uh, with Steve and we were able to um, tweak some conditions in the incubation time um, and pepsin uh, contact time to, and um, thus producing us some um, data that we can actually analyze and um, enough for us to generate some insights. So bear with me, this is a really heavy uh, slide but I will try my best to explain um, the data. So this is the difference map um, of um, the promyostatin in the presence of uh, difference map of uh, in the presence of 29H416 or SRK015, which is our apitigromab. So basically, um, it is um, as you, if you see blue there, there's significant protection um, of upon significant protection of that region of the protein upon binding to the antibody. So as you can see overall across the protein, you see some regions that are heavily protected and some are slightly protected. Um, and if this will be more, make more sense if you actually map it into the structure. If you map it into the structure, you can see that HDX actually um, um, showed protection with um, on top of the arm region of the protein. And some regions really, uh, the moment I saw this data, I was like, wow. Um, because what highlighted here is regions of the proteins, like especially the furin sites and part of the toloid sites um, 
if you if I can highlight it here. So if you see here, I have here the toloid site representative peptides, and I have here furin site uh, representative peptide. So I was really, uh, I would say, lucky that I got some coverage of the peptide that's are missing in the crystal structure. So this is actually the first data to really see some structural data to uh, show some changes in the conformational dynamics or confirmations of, um, of the part of this uh, peptide within the permyosin. And this is the representative um, deuterium uptake plot. As you can see, um, the black line indicates the apomyosin, permyosin without any antibody. The green line indicates, uh, um, the green and the blue line indicates the presence of uh, the antibody. You can see uh, really significant protection, um, especially in the furin site here and some protection with, uh, within the region of the toloid site. And regions of the um, arm region here and beta-5. So remember this is beta-5 beta is on top of the arm region of the prodomain. You can see here significant protection too in beta-7 as well. So, it, so if you look into, if you, um, the, the epitope has been also elucidated by HDX. And if you compare the epitope identified by co-crystal structure, as well as HDX, really they are agrees really nicely. In, in fact, um, the red lines are the epitope that we have identified uh, by HDX, and the blue lines here are the blue um, highlighted in blue are the epitopes that have been elucidated by X-ray crystallography. So there is a very uh, good um, agreement between the two techniques, which is really good. This is actually my first ever data that I have a crystal structure as well as um, in the HDX data, because as a, it, for the HDX sometimes, you know, um, uh, you, you can see the significant protection, but it's like, is this a real response, you know, or is this the, you know, the binding region, or it could be the binding region, but it could be an allosteric effect, you know, like some regions of unbinding, there are some changes, um, um, distal to the binding region, um, there are some changes in the, uh, the conformation um, outside of the binding region. So, but with the crystal structure, um, it makes us like, give us more booster confidence that this is the epitope as well as um, um, interpreting some other structural insights from, uh, from HDX. So speaking of an, uh, structural insights, the next slide will, will show, show you that I highlighted the main points here. Um, so the each exchange profiles in regions of the prodomain covering the toloid and the furin, I would highlight so remember, this is the um, toloid site here. You see significant protection, as well as the furin sites here uh, down below, um, especially in the perlmyostatin um, protein. Uh, you can see significant protection. Um, this may suggest that uh, with this protection, meaning from high, like flexible, high, highly flexible upon binding to the antibody, this, this region of the protein within the, uh, adjoining the toloid and the furin sites um, are, are being uh, less flexible or solvent accessible. So this may suggest that uh, limited access to these sites to proteases for conversion of this promyostatin to latent myostatin. Um, another key point here is that, and this is very, I would say, um, it's the realizations towards the end when I get the, the bird's eye view of the data. So we, I, I also saw conformational flexibility of region, changes in the overall conformational um, flexib flexibility of regions adjoining. The alpha helix, I wanna highlight here, uh, alpha helix here, and then the latency lasso, um, alpha two and beta one strand. So these regions here are structural regions that are proposed to be key in maintaining the myostatin latency. So basically we're hit, we hit it, we hit upon binding to the antibody, we also, not only it actually binds to the arm region, uh, the impact also can be felt down across the regions where, um, where these structural elements are, these critical structural elements are being, uh, its conformations have been affected um, in the presence uh, upon binding to the antibody. 
So this is really one of the uh, key data that were really so the first personally when I saw it, I was really so excited about it because it actually ties to the literature that these regions are key in maintaining the um, uh, latency or um, maintaining the inactivity of the protein. So yes, and that's it for the SRK, uh, the epidogramab story with a promyostatin. I'm gonna jump to the uh, second study, which is um, SRK015, uh, SRK181. Oh, sorry, I still have one data. So uh, we have HDX. So really what's missing so far is um, with the HDX and co-crystal structure, we utilize a, an antibody fragments. So really we didn't, we don't know how our, a full IgG, full monoclonal antibody binds to the protein. So what's the orientation, the precise orientation and stoichiometry of the full antibody? So we have a hint. Um, we, we use an SAC multi-angle scattering data uh, and it suggested that um, um, epitogromab binds, the full IgG binds one latent mystatin homodimer uh, uh, to one SRK01, uh, five full IgG. So this is the data. This is the latent myostatin with SRK015. So you can see it's a, it's a bigger complex uh, compared to its individual components. Like green is the latent myostatin and the full IgG SRK015 or the epitogramma um, is this uh, profile. And, and what the first thing we, we thought in mind is like, um, we can use a more kind of like micromolecular approach like really seeing it. And we think about negative stain EM, a very uh, quick, not quick, but really um, straightforward approach of like seeing it, if your protein actually behaves well, negative st stain EM is really nice to, uh, to complement whatever um, previous structural data you have generated to really understand the overall story. So we perform negative stain EM to really define some structural features of, I would like to highlight, it's a full antibody. Remember, co-crystal structures and HDX, we use an antibody fragment, which is the FAB. So now we have the full antibody antigen complex to really kind of com uh, validate our results with the co-crystal structure as well as uh, the HDX. So we uh, collaborated with Nano Imaging Services um, in San Diego, California. They have farms of not only a negative stain EM scopes or like the Techni 212, they also have farms of uh, um, um, scopes capable of um, doing cryo-electron across single particle cryo e, uh, EM. Um, they have a lot of cryos there. So, and what with this is we have the protein, we, we, we um, I put it in a grid, uh, we do negative stain, we do 2D classification, and we generated initial model and projections, and, and then we actually interpret the data. So this is the result. Uh, the first time we saw this data, I cannot actually believe it, um, uh, that this first few pass, um, the data looks like so defined. We didn't even go to a third round of, um, of alignment. We only went to uh, second round of alive 2D classification because uh, we can literally see the whole details of the uh, micromolecular interaction of the full IgG with with the uh, uh, pro and late myostatin. So in this left here, I would like to um, um, to highlight that uh, we were able to um, to complement or I would say uh, confirm the results from um, the crystal structure because the crystal structure utilizes our high affinity mature form of the, per, of the protein or the antibody, which is 29H416. So with the full IgG, you can appreciate, really you can see the V-shaped uh, form of the protein of the promyostatin interacting on top of, um, on top, uh, interacting on top of it is the two fob arms of the full IgG. So in the lens around um, 21 nanometer, and then the width is like 10 nanometer particle size. So, and you can see here the FC region, I would like to highlight too, right? The constant region of the antibody, you can see it has a different form, right? So you can see 
this angle here with this angle here. It's kind of different. Essentially, that could be explained because um, between the fab and in the constant region, there's a hinge region of the, within, in the antibody, which are actually very flexible. So the flexibility uh, could be uh, in, in the, um, the, the difference in the conformations of the FC could be accounted to the, due to the flexibility of the hinge region in the antibody. So we have this and um, another orientation here of the FC. And we also found the, the unbound one, unbound, uh, unbound full antibody. And you can see the electron density around the fab and the FC region. And if you actually superimpose, so we tried this super, let's try to see if we superimpose the crystal structure um, into the electron density of the, um, um, the EM. And um, surprisingly, it actually fits. I don't know if, uh, if uh, judging by looking at it, you can actually see there's a superimposition of the, um, uh, uh, the cartoon or the, uh, the cartoon of the corpus structure into the electron density generated by negative stain EM. Mm -hmm. And um, complementarily, uh, also um, in addition, we performed, this is our apitogrel map, right? So remember the apitogrel map is in the similar epitope binding region um, as uh, the S29H416. And you can actually see that um, similarly, you can see the binding, uh, the, the antibody binding into the arm region of the protein. And you can see the FC here. Um, so basically um, two, two, the two fabs of the antibody um, anchors the, 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 the arm region of the, uh, my statin homodimer. So the, 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 for the remaining um, time, I would like to discuss case study number two. So this is a very, uh, uh, this is our uh, SRK181 lead molecule, which is also, which is currently an investigational drug for, um, for, for uh, immune oncology, um, cancer indications. We have published a paper um, with, it's a team of us, uh, it's ColorArc really um, putting all across functional teams to really put in the data, generate the data and put in the data and tell the story um, about um, selective inhibition of TG beta one um, can overcome primary resistance to checkpoint blockade therapy by altering tumor immune landscape. Well, we published it in Science Translation of Medicine. Uh, it was last year. So what is, um, what is the uh, rationale behind it? Um, essentially, um, what is the motivation really? So nearly 80% of patients failed to respond to checkpoint inhibitor therapies. And this actually our clinical der clinically derived rationale to explore the opportunity in increasing checkpoint therapy responses. So why is that so? Uh, um, essentially what we have discovered is that human tumor analysis Reveals reveal that TJ beta one as the most prevalent isoform in several human cancers, and this is has been shown in this specific um, data. This is a um, RNA seq analysis of greater than ten thousand samples across several tumor types. So you can see that TJ beta one, two, and three um, have they have various um, differentiate uh, differential expression. Um, across several types of tumors. And as you can see, uh, TJ beta one is the most prevalent, prevalent isoform. Then the question is, um, would inhibis, inhibiting TJ beta could impact this, um, uh, this, um, 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 this approach of overcoming um, resistance of, uh, uh, of these tumors to, to checkpoint inhibitors. So we then set to um, discover a molecule against TJ beta one. So remember, apitigromab. I just want to mention, apitigromab is for promystatin. As our K one at one is for TJ beta one. So this one is discovered to by um, another display platform. Uh, it's a yeast display platform, and. Um, it has undergone SRK181, which is an investigational drug, again, I mentioned that it has undergone affinity maturation and engineering, and we have this SRK181. 
So I, can, I just want to show some highlight data, highlight data here. Uh, binding NSA revealed by uh, biolayer interferometry um, revealed that this antibody really is very specific to one uh, and showed minimal, minimal binding to beta three, two and three. And it's very, fun it's functional in our um, cell-based assay. So we, uh, we uh, in ongoing efforts are also been uh, conducted in-house, uh, not in-house, but in, in our company in collaboration with, um, with um, um, external um, contract research organizations to really give us a crystal structure of this. But on, in parallel, we also did, I did some uh, at HGX and mass spectrometry to really highlight uh, or answer the question, where is this antibody binding to? So it turned out that this antibody binds to the latency lasso. So the latency lasso is this uh, part of the protein here, highlighted um, in red and orange. So basically this is the, uh, the typical structure of TJ beta. Um, it has this pro-domain cage, and this is the growth factor highlighted in green. So, and the regions of, I also highlighted some protease sites, calcrine site uh, highlighted here. So the antibody binds in this region. Um, and if you look into some representative uh, deuterium uptakes, you can actually see some uh, uh, protection um, when the antibody binds. Um, binds to the, uh, to the protein. And some regions are highlighted, region one in red, region two in orange, region three, and uh, region three here in yellow. So basically these are actually confined within the uh, latency lasso of, uh, of protege beta one. And um, uh, there's just a control on RGD region, right? We also have some antibodies. I did some HDX, I will not show the data, but I did some HDX, um, also some um, antibody, we saw some binding to RGB. Um, so, but then with this specific molecule, we didn't see any binding to RGB. Um, so really highlighting the fact that it only binds to uh, this region of the protein. So if you look into the sequence of the uh, epitope, you can actually see, if you see dot here, that means that sequence part of the protein is really unique. So if you if you uh, sequence align all this uh, within the epitope region, sequence align it um, with other TG beta one, two, and three, you can appreciate that uh, the binding region is um, really unique to per TG beta one. Uh, th again, that explains why um, the the uh, SRK one one is very selective to uh, only to put protege beta one, but not to beta two or beta three. So uh, as a proof of concept, uh, there, we have um, tested this antibody. Uh, we generated a mouse version of this antibody. Uh, I also want to mention that this SRK181 is really um, a species cross-reactive, mouse, uh, sino, and human. So, we use some uh, preclinical models of um, uh, ca uh, cancers. Um, in this specific example, we have a melanoma model. Um, it's a syngenic mouse model. So we uh, tested the, the hypothesis that when we combined um, this inhibitor, um, protege beta-1 inhibitor, SRK1 and 1, together with the existing uh, checkpoint inhibitors, um, um, uh, we will uh, we will promote um, um, penetration of cytotoxic toxic T cells um, into the tumor cells, into the tumor site, and then killing all those cancer cells. So this is the data um, you can actually see in monotherapy um, or alone SRK1 in one. You can see responder is zero. There's uh, in terms of tumor volume, it's as as time increases, you can see that the tumor increases. So there's not really much effect of SRK1 in one mouse IgG1 alone, as well as with just using some um, anti-checkpoint uh, inhibitor, um, you can see that there are some responders, right? So, um, but then when you do a combination therapy, it's really striking 
that at the low dose combination of H10 uh, meg per keg, you can actually see some significant um, responses. Uh, you see the decrease in tumor volumes in some of these mice. In fact, you have a score of four mice responded out of the nine mice that have been um, used in the study. And if even we higher the dose, you can actually see that there are more responders, meaning there are some more mice that's been um, where the volume, the, the tumor volume has, has, uh, has been decreased uh, in the presence of this combination of checkpoint inhibitors and SRK181. And it can, it is, it was translated to survival benefit too. So with the combination therapy, it shows that there's more survival benefit um, compared to just SRK181 alone or anti-PD1 alone. So really, this is one of the highlight data here, um, like um, what happens, right? Um, um, if we have um, took some cross sections of the tissue and look into the CD8 positive T cells, and you can see here in the just the anti-PD1 alone um, control, uh, controlled, you can see that the CDT cells, we call it, and there's some immune exclusion. Um, there's, there's some kind of less um, penetration of uh, cytotox cytotoxic T cells into the tumor. But in combination, SRK181 combined with the checkpoint inhibitor, anti-PD1, you can actually see fluxes of CD8 positive T cells in the tumor cells, in the tumor site. Right, so really highlighting the fact that with with the with the presence with using the approach of the combination therapy, you can uh, potentially overcome um, the uh, resistance of these tumors tumor cells with checkpoint inhibitor therapies. Um, not only that, we use melanoma. There are also, if you look into our science paper, science translational medicine paper, we also tested MBT2, M EMT6 uh, mouse models, which are models of breast cancer models, um, that, and showed some similar results. So, this is uh, one of my um, uh, final few slides. Um, really, uh, this SRK181 highlights um, that it, it's a unique protege beta selective approach to overcoming checkpoint inhibitor resistance. I have shown you the proof of concept in the previous slides in our preclinical um, mouse model studies. And it's very highly selective um, as I've uh, seen the, uh, shown the data about not with minor inhibition or minor binding to TG beta 2 and TG beta 3 isoc one and we also think um, that with SRK181, we aim at increasing therapeutic window, uh, potentially avoiding uh, toxicities. Remember, PAN-TJ beta inhibitors, uh, I've mentioned about cardio, cardiac uh, valve uh, toxicity. So with just one specific TJ beta inhibition, uh, uh, potentially we can avoid this uh, tox uh, potential toxicities down the road. And Oh, as well as some therapeutic flexibility, we can pair, potentially we can pair this SRK181 with other CPI inhibitor, the checkpoint inhibitors, and really optimize dosing of each component of combination therapy. And I would like to mention that um, this specific molecule is now in phase one clinical trial for immune oncology. Several um, um, cancer types, so mostly solid tumors, um, ranging from um, urethial cancer um, and some other um, uh, cancer types. So as a summary for, for this is uh, as, as a summary for, for, for what I have um, discussed to you and, and the story that, that Scholar Wright is, um, is telling is that the use of an integrative structural approach uh, combined with relevant in vitro and in vivo pharmacology approaches uh, facilitated the uh, um, really elucidation of molecular mechanism of a therapeutic strategy of targeting the precursor forms of TJ beta super family of growth factors, uh, preventing its activation and signaling. So basically the, uh, the mechanisms of um, um, activation in, in the TJ beta super family of growth factors 
uh, it, the theme of that is by extracellular, extracellular proteolytic processing. So that's this, this approach that we are taking really specifically targeting the precursor form of the protein uh, to block activation. It can be really broadly applied to other members of the TJ beta superfamily. Um, um, hopefully um, this may facilitate discovery of therapeutics in uh, several really debilitating diseases, um, including muscular atrophy um, was mostly affected by like, uh, I've seen children, patients with, with muscular atrophy and you cannot imagine like they're suffering, you know? So this, you can actually impact um, um, with, with, with this um, discovery approaches. Uh, with this uh, type of patients and also form of cancers. So, and my last slide, of course, I would like to thank Scholar Rock's research and development team. Uh, it's a bunch of um, um, really uh, highly collaborative, um, engaging um, talents in Scholar Rock and I would like to thank all of them. Um, I would like to highlight um, and thank Steve Isles for really, uh, um, helping me carry out this um, HDX. Without him, actually, I wouldn't be able to generate this um, data. And I would also would like to mention that some, um, um, some of the uh, HDX data, um, data that I generated at UMass actually were into our patent applications and we granted patents across all of our assets in Scholar Rock. Um, so really, it highlights the impact of um, HDX mass spectrometry um, into really protecting the assets and elucidating mechanisms of actions of the um, antibody-based therapeutics. And I'm sure for small molecules, this is also applicable. And I would also like to thank Nano Imaging Services. I like their service. Um, they're very responsive and most of our um, electron microscopy works, we work with them. And uh, to our Harikar Bio, uh, which is now uh, become Icaria, we're our, our um, collaborator for some of our uh, crystallography um, experiments. And with that, I would like to thank you. And I will, I can entertain questions if you have one. Great, thank you, Kevin. That's a fantastic talk. Um, are there any questions from audience members? Steve, I have I have a couple of questions. Sure. So, Kevin, first off, it's really incredible to finally get to see your work, and I was really blown away with how much data you have to show and how impressive the work is. So that was really awesome and really fun. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have kind of three questions. Um, the first one is, you know, since we're putting this in the perspective of HDX, and then you showed us in the first part of your talk how the HDX really matched the crystal structure. And then later you showed that the crystal structure really fit perfectly into the cryo, into the EM data. Um, I guess the extension there is that the HDX really correlates with the EM also, but were yep. there things you got from the HDX that you, like, I guess what struck me is you're at a company, right? And you wanna, you wanna know how this antibody binds and how it works, but at some level, you just kind of wanna know is it working in humans, you know? So I'm impressed yeah. that your company put so much effort into so many different levels of structural biology characterization. And so I'm just kind of curious about, you know, what, what's your thought about what was the added value of the HDX on top of the crystallography and the EM? Yeah, so for, it has, for, for several assets that we have, we have using the HDX, we have several questions or several uses, I would say. For specific to um, the apitigromab, for example, what really drives us to pursue it because of 
our initial data, right? Like we know that it binds, uh, our antibody map can inhibit toluoid mediated cleavage. Uh, with the crystal structure, we didn't see those regions, right? It's disordered. So really, um, as well as our, our, um, our uh, epitope with the crystal structure, we can see it there in the arm region. But the thing is, we cannot really, as I mentioned, we cannot explain it. Like, uh, why it doesn't, it's so distal, the protein site is so distal from, from the epitope, right, it's on top. So we think with the HDX, we pursue is that maybe there are some regions in, in, in those critical sites for the proteolytic, proteolytic sites, we can have some idea of what happens there. And in fact, we actually saw some coverage for those regions and we saw some changes in the proteolytic events, uh, prote uh, confirmations really from flexible to less flexible, really changes in confirmation upon binding of the antibody. And for some of the, for, for the case of SRK1 and 1 really, we didn't get any crystal structure. We tried so many things already. Uh, it just didn't crystallize the protein, right? So what is the other approaches really to, to give us some idea of the epitope region? So we use HDX because we know for a fact that um, um, from previous data that we can actually do some, it's complementary, I would say. Um, it's a medium resolution, but you, it's enough to really get a glimpse of the binding region. So, and with the SRK181, we, would we were able to kind of have some idea of why it actually inhibits SRK uh, protege beta one specifically, because in fact, the protected, protected region um, is uh, being um, um, identified within the latency less, which is one of the highly divergent region of the protein. So there's some added value to it in, um, on top of uh, um, really um, uh, dynamics as well as some, um, um, we just, because we don't have data, we can actually pursue this uh, HDX on top of crystal structure and cry -EM. So. Great, thank you. The other just very quick question, and I don't know if you're allowed to answer this, but <laughs> I was just curious when you, you know, used a CRO for the nano imaging, yeah. Do you know how much that costs? Oh, that one, it really depends on um, the level of resolution you want or the level, the, the sample and the uh, levels of um, work that you want to do. So you can actually do optimization, but then each optimization, it will cost you um, a little bit of um, additional cost, but in the range of negative stanium for sure, uh, for, for in, uh, uh, for nano imaging, it's around um, 30, 30 to 40K. So just, for, yeah, but you can, so with the, with, you can also pursue cry -M with them, um, but it's kind of, the price will get- Much bigger. Uh, bigger. No, uh, for one, for one sample, sorry, th it's actually lesser, sorry, uh, 13K. Uh, then if you do multiple samples, they, because they will, they will treat each control as a sample, right? So, but then you actually have to have kind of like a control in a way. So that makes us like uh, close to like 20, 20 to 30,000, roughly rough estimate for that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, Kevin. So, um, hi, Mary. Hi. That was really beautiful. I love seeing the complementarity of the different techniques and the and the whole story of how useful it is. So my question is, um, I thought it was pretty cool how the HDX showed the uh, protection in the regions of the cleavage. And I think your hypothesis is that that's why the antibody is inhibiting. Do you have other antibodies that bind but don't inhibit? And could you show maybe that those don't show protection in those regions? So there, so there are antibodies so there's, there are antibodies that actually bind to, to some other regions of the protein, but to the other, the opposite way. Um, and there are some antibodies that um, binds to the region of the, uh, some other antibodies, not just SRK1 in one. We have actually sets of antibodies and it binds some kind of within the latency of lasso, but then some regions actually are also being affected down into like the alpha one helix. So it's kind of like the coverage. It's it's like more onto like um, 
um, some protection here a little bit and some protection down here in the protein, like in the, towards the, the alpha helix side of the protein. So we have those kind of antibodies, um, um, like flavors that we, we, we actually did. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I thought you could use the HDX to test the hypothesis that it's, you know, when you get inhibition, it's because you see an uptake change in those um, regions where cleavage has to happen. Yeah, I think the only data that we have, as I mentioned, is that we, we, so we uh, that I did was that when 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 it binds to not to the latency lasso, but to the to the region of the bow tie, the RGD site. Um, it did the opposite way. It activates it. So there's more activation. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Can I ask a question? <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Uh, yes, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you how you plan to use your data on dynamics for uh, how is that going to change your therapeutic strategy and design of monoclonal antibodies? Have you used it in drug design, basically? Oh, oh yeah, basically we have, uh, we actually use this to inform um, kind of like approaches like uh, if we can hit some regions of the protein, this really very, uh, say for example, for the latency lasso, uh, we know that when we hit this region and we see some dynamics of this protein, we know that uh, whenever the epitope, region or the binding region is around this region, or um, then we that actually can be a hot spot, I would say, uh, for really uh, honing, on some, honing some antibodies towards that region. Or some actually approaches like, oh, avoiding this region because we don't want the regions. We don't want changes in the dynamics of the loops within the bow tie region, close to the RGD. We don't want those because then that can actually do the opposite. So, so really, yes, um, those um, data generated from HDX and really showing the dynamics of the loops regions within the protein help us really um, kind of um, uh, very carefully navigate our discovery approaches. So, so basically, if you if you see dynamics in a, one region, and then do you think you uh, did you? Think of putting some uh, antibody with the loop there, or maybe a more rigid part. So have that have that influenced your choice? What kind of um, protein sequence you would put there? I mean, peptide sequence. Yeah, definitely the engineering approaches too. Um, we have uh, used that specific um, for. Uh, especially for affinity maturation, you know, um, really making it uh, some approaches we want to make to develop to develop or make a better version of that, you know, putting mm -hmm. in several key interactions. Even though without the crystal structure, we can somehow uh, model it in a way that oh, this region, oh, this interaction, maybe we can do better. You know, we can make it more the binding tighter. You know, so those are. Um, the uses in a way once we have determined the idea of where the binding region is. Okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions for Kevin? Okay, then I guess we're all set. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you all for attending today's seminar. Our next seminar is scheduled for Tuesday, November 2nd, which we will be hosting the WET Center. Michael Murphy from X20 Corp will be our guest speaker, and the title of this talk is Developing a Low-Cost Smartphone-Based Water Quality Sensor. Hope to see you there. Goodbye, everyone.